June 24th was a grim day in Britain's ivory towers. The Brexit vote, a punch on the nose for an intellectual elite who had lined up in favour of staying in the EU. This will be a victory for ordinary people. But did the referendum reveal, perhaps even cause, a lasting change in our relationship with the people we once believed knew best? The Bank of England, the IFS, the IMF, the CBI, and most of the leaders of the trade unions in Britain in this country all say at last get a fair deal. I think the people in this country have had enough of experts with uh, organisations experts. from acronyms people... saying that they know what is best and getting people... it consistently wrong. Michael Gove may have trotted out a glib soundbite to deflect an awkward question, but it was one with potentially profound implications. Have we ceased to believe that men and women with years of accumulated specialist knowledge are worth listening to? And if we have, does that reflect a healthy willingness to challenge orthodoxy or something more worrying? An assault on the very idea that society is built on reason and evidence? Those who are expert, who have the knowledge, who have um, the intellectual ability to dissect these difficult problems are being derided and pushed back. In recent years, politicians have increasingly pushed experts to the fore to justify their decisions. But in a world where experts lose trust, how can politicians tackle climate change or convince us that vaccinations are safe? Look at the experts we've had, okay? Look at the experts. Some even see in the anti-expert rhetoric a slippery slope that leads to the post-fact morass of Trump's America. You know, I've always wanted to say this. I've never said this before. With all the talking we all do, all of these experts, oh, we need an expert. The experts are terrible. The assault on experts has implications for fields from medicine to intelligence, but it's economists who found themselves on the front line. We are right to question experts, particularly after what happened uh, in the referendum when experts said that consumer confidence would fall, the stock market would fall, growth would cease, house prices would go up immediately as a result of the vote, not as a result of Brexit. Uh, and they were wrong. Do you think it's time we gave up listening to economists? I, I think we should pay a lot of attention to economists except when they're talking about the future. Just balance the budget. In 1949, a young economist from New Zealand built this contraption in his Croydon garage. He used bits of old Lancaster bombers and DIY skills picked up in a Japanese POW camp. Phillips's machine, now at Cambridge University, uses flows of water to model the behaviour of the British economy, literally trickle-down economics. The economy comes out through here, round the pump at the back, this is income after taxation, some of which goes off to savings, so this is the banking sector over here. It could be a perfect metaphor for what's wrong with economics. The embodiment of a mechanistic view that assumes people will behave like molecules in a test tube. Social science masquerading as science. So it's telling us if, when you move the levers in the economy, how the economy will perform. Yes. It is a model of the economy as a machine, isn't it? I mean, is it reasonable to see the economy as a machine? I don't know. That's a deeply philosophical question. Um, it solves the equations. Economic forecasting has always been a bit hit and miss. Its only function, said J.K. Galbraith, was to make astrology look respectable. Economists flag up the uncertainty and assumptions behind their predictions with forests of caveats. But that nuance is often stripped away by politicians or the media or both. In defense of economists, I would say that short-term forecasting is extremely difficult. Uh, we're talking about trying to predict the actions of millions of different consumers across the economy and trying to impose some order on all of that, um, those millions of decisions, is inevitably going to be really difficult. Victoria Bateman is an economic historian. She thinks the attack on experts has implications far beyond economics. I also think it was dangerous. When we look throughout history, when we look at attempts to 
uh, attack intellectuals, and those go back to the uh, period before the Enlightenment. I think it's particularly dangerous for a Western politician in a Western democracy to be playing this game of anti-intellectualising. I think the people in this country have had enough of experts with uh, organisations... It's perhaps ironic that a man regarded as one of the most intellectual figures in British politics is now famous for one of its most anti-intellectual sound bites. Gove insists he was quoted out of context. He didn't mean to impugn all experts. I was particularly thinking about organisations like the IMF, who I thought had called the euro wrong and were calling the referendum wrong. And I felt, at the very least, we should challenge their arguments rather than simply saying, oh well, because you're a tenured academic or because you work for the IMF, you must be right. You're famous for your linguistic rigour. Why, why didn't you say something more like what you just said to me? It was a high profile, high intensity, high tension, high nervousness encounter. There's a difference between the considered use of language in a conversation like this, um, and having to think fast on your feet. Do you regret it? Do you regret having used the word experts in that context? No, I think um, it's, life's too short for regrets. I think one of the things that uh, is occasionally irritating is that people assume that what I was saying was uh, a blanket rejection of uh, facts, evidence, rigor. So you don't trust Mark Carney or the Chancellor or the Prime Minister? No, not really. No, no. they don't know any more than we do, do they? Really? Before the referendum, Newsnight came to Bognor, where Joan and some friends told us why they would ignore warnings from experts like the Governor of the Bank of England. Does he know what it's like to go around Sainsbury's shopping? Does he know what it's like? That line seemed to reveal something profound about our changing relationship with experts, so we've come back. Joan's away, but over a cup of tea, I asked a few of the locals how experts lost their trust. There's too much scaremongering from so-called experts. Um, there's too many organisations and businesses that um, all they do is study graphs and take polls and and they just seem to make a living out of it. And I don't believe that they can, they know best. I don't think they know best. How on earth do we decide what to listen to and, and what not to listen to? You listen up here. A lot of people have got good common sense. Graham, you were not impressed by the expertise of academics. Why are you sceptical about uh, people who've spent often years studying their subject. Well, they're just ordinary people, but unfortunately they get stuck in this little bubble of what they're doing. So you'll make all your judgment based on, on what, what you study. hear, yes. not, not on what their yeah. qualifications yes. are. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It depends on what they actually say. But it sounds like what you're saying is we should just pick the experts we agree with. Well, there's plenty of them out there. Perhaps not everywhere in Britain is as allergic to boffins as Bogner, but it does seem we're far less willing to take the pronouncements of experts as gospel. So how did we get here? Well, at least part of the answer must lie with the internet and the way it handed us all the keys to the kind of specialist knowledge that once took years to acquire. Which of us hasn't diagnosed an ailment with a little help from Dr. Google long before arriving in the doctor's waiting room? If the internet has chipped away at the respect commanded by many experts, it's done the opposite for one man. Polls, if they still count for anything, consistently found that Martin Lewis was the figure trusted most on Brexit. He thinks the trouble starts when experts start predicting the future. Because you can't make that prediction. This is a world about probability and chance, but what we had in the EU referendum was people giving us black and white answers all the time. Lewis thinks that part of the problem is that many experts appeared to take sides in the referendum argument. It was a problem we wrestled with on Newsnight. In the eyes of the two campaigns, no expert was sufficiently independent for both to agree on. I think some experts made the mistake of, being, of campaigning and therefore presenting their views as part of a campaign which immediately says that you're biased one way or the other and the public will perceive it and not trust you. 
And even those who didn't then allowed their information to be used in a polemic way. If the Enlightenment has its sacred texts, one of them is Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica. Newton's own annotated copy is the prized possession of Trinity College's Wren Library, a temple to knowledge so chilly the librarians wear anoraks. So this is Newton's own copy of the Principia Mathematica? This is indeed. It's one of the great works of Western science. You know, incredibly important. It's the book that inflicted calculus on centuries well, of school in, <laughs> Indeed it did. <laughs> Newton helped put science at the centre of our modern world. Yet some worry that the assault on experts has spread beyond economics and the social sciences and now challenges science itself. Unfortunately, Mr Goh's remarks spilled over into all sorts of other areas where experts have an enormous contribution to make to the proper running of society um, and for good policy development. Science is absolutely there because science is based on reason, on evidence, and the fact that um, experts have been derided in this way does have an effect in undermining science and scientific evidence. We've come to another temple to knowledge, London's gleaming Francis Crick Institute. Nobel Prize winning geneticist Paul Nurse believes Michael Gove probably was thinking of economists in his infamous comment, but it was irresponsible not to clarify his remarks. Opinions on the, uh, on the front foot. And those who are expert, who have the knowledge, who have um, the intellectual ability to dissect these difficult problems, are being derided and pushed back. My view about this is that it cannot last very long because their, their opinion is not built on firm foundations and it rapidly falls apart and I think we're seeing that already with, for example, Mr Trump. Science is built to last. The expert bashers believe they were vindicated by the fact that most economists got the short-term consequences of a Brexit vote wrong. But have they started something more dangerous? Has Gove emboldened people to dismiss all kinds of expert advice they don't like? Do you worry about that at all, the way that you've actually let something bigger get rolling that you perhaps didn't mean to? I entirely understand that, yes. And um, I think that I'm sure that there are people who've latched on that word, either those who uh, fear that, that rise of um, you know, a superstitious approach towards knowledge, um, who think that I may have legitimised it. And it may be that there are some people out there who think that, that, that I'm giving them licence to operate in that way. Who's to say? All I would say is that that phrase apart, during my political lifetime, both when I was Education Secretary and when I was Justice Secretary, I wanted people to know more, to have more information and knowledge and a greater capacity for critical thinking. You were out campaigning every day after that interview. You could at any point in the days after when I'm sure it came up countless times, you could have qualified that remark. Funnily enough, it didn't come up that often uh, during the, the referendum campaign. I think it was used particularly afterwards because people felt that the, the, the Brexit vote had somehow been a triumph of uh, know-nothing anti-fact populism. My argument is actually that um, uh, many of those who were making assertions during the campaign um, on the Remain side were relying on people meekly submitting to authority as though we were still operating in the age of the pre-Reformation Catholic Church rather than actually making proper arguments. Science writer Matt Ridley believes this greater public scepticism about experts is healthy. The very opposite, in fact, of the challenge to Enlightenment values others fear. One has to remember that the Enlightenment did consist of challenging the experts, particularly challenging priests, uh, and saying you don't have all the answers, people can work out the answers for themselves. It's hard to argue that a more questioning public is a bad thing, but here's the problem. Where do we stop? All these people have had experts. Oh, we need an expert. The experts are terrible. Can any layman decide if the evidence on climate change stacks up, or whether vaccines are safe, or whether it's safe to eat GM crops? After seeing their Brexit advice ignored, at least one expert decided to express herself more forcefully in the days after the referendum. 
yes, yeah, so I made the decision to spend the day at the university naked as, um, as both an expression of my feelings about the referendum, which is that it's a rather dramatic event and will have dramatic long-term consequences, but at the human level, more importantly, as a show of um, solidarity. Victoria attended the monthly faculty meeting wearing only the words Brexit leaves us naked scrawled across her torso. For some, the scene might have been a perfect metaphor for our changing relationship with experts. The emperor revealed to have been naked all along. So did Michael Gove put his finger on something no one had yet noticed? Or did he help to cause it? If only there was an expert we could ask.